So again, uh, my name is Byung. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Sourcegraph. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sourcegraph is a semantic code search engine that lets you uh, explore, browse, and search uh, all the open source code available on the web and also the code inside your company. Uh, we index um, most of the Go open source world, so if you use a lot of Go open source and you know want a great tool for exploring uh, code and reading it and finding usage examples and learning how best to use you know, a given function or method, check us out. Uh, we're actually coming out with a private beta um, soon that will let you download Sourcegraph and run it on your private code. So if you know you have trouble with like searching for code or exploring it on your private code or are unhappy with your code review process, uh, come talk to me or one of the other Sourcegraph people afterwards and we can send you the link to the private beta. So this still does not work. Oh, that's why. <laughs> that's why it zoomed. Okay, so the slides for this talk um, are at this link, uh, github.com slash sourcegraph slash talks. Um, I'm going to be doing a recap of GopherCon. So, um, you know, we were doing the official live blog uh, uh, at GopherCon. So we wrote up, you know, detailed technical summaries of all the talks that we saw there. Um, and so this talk is mostly going to be pointing you to uh, the links to those descriptions uh, so that you can see for yourself. I think that's the best way to do a recap. Like I'm not the one who uh, came up with all these great talks and ideas. It's best if you uh, got it straight from the source. And um, that'll be up for you know the next uh, couple of weeks. I'm told that the videos should be up uh, within two weeks. Um, so look for that when that comes out. But yeah, with that, let's just dive right in. So. You know, GopherCon 2015 this year was an awesome conference. It was the second annual GopherCon. Um, there were 1,500 attendees, which is more than double what it was the year before, which is amazing. Uh, and there were a lot of great companies uh, well represented there that are using Go. So there's kind of the usual suspects, you know, Docker, CoreOS, Twitch, uh, Mesosphere, Datadog, FluxDB, and Sourcegraph. But there are also, you know, some companies that you might not have expected uh, were using Go in production at scale. And these included Companies like Verizon, Comcast, uh, Aetna, which is one of the largest uh, EHR providers in the nation, healthcare.gov uses Go. They use Go in uh, their rewrite. Um, that actually got the site to, to work. Um, <laughs> and Cisco uses Go. And so again, there's the link to the live blog. Um, but some high-level themes that we noticed uh, covering the conference this year, um, two big themes, uh, three big themes that popped out at us uh, were the themes of like building the community, um, the history of the language, and uh, using Go in enterprise. So delving into each of those, um, community was a big theme um, in some of the key talks at the conference this year. The focus is um, around recognizing that you know, what makes a language community strong is not just the language itself or the technology around it, but also the people that comprise the community. And I think that's, one of, uh, that's been one of the key assets of the Go community so far. It's, a community of passionate people who are dedicated to um, you know, building things in practice that has made, really made, you know, go uh, the strong uh, language that it is today that, that is being used uh, in a bunch of companies in production. And moving forward, um, you know, we need to be conscious of the fact that, you know, the strength of the, of the Go community is really based on, you know, how many people we can really convince to adopt Go and use it inside their companies. And you know, as part of that effort, we need to be mindful of you know, making the community feel welcome, uh, continuing to make the community feel uh, welcoming to newcomers to the community, especially those from you know, groups that have been traditionally un underrepresented in the broader tech community. Um, and in doing so, we'll create a more diverse culture that will strengthen you know, the, d the diversity of ideas uh, that are present in the language and will basically make Go that much uh, better of a community and language uh, to be a part of. Studies have shown that uh, you know, monocultures are not as robust um, to change and evolution as you know, organizations and groups with a lot of diversity. And so this was a point that you know, a lot of the, the Go core uh, people at Google really emphasize. You know, Go has done very well as a community thus far in 
kind of building a culture of um, inclusiveness and moving forward we only need to, to do a better job of that to make sure that we can really spread go to you know, every corner of the earth um, so Andrew Garand and Russ Cox talked about you know drafting up a code of conduct uh, that would kind of put down writing the sort of guidelines um, to direct uh, the, the community moving forward um, and another point that was brought up was the fact that you know the go community has been a big contributor to uh, you know, go thus far. Um, you know, we've implemented uh, a lot of additions to go. We've ported it to um, you know new platforms. We've uh, added new features, contributed to the standard library. But thus far, a lot of the uh, design, uh, the high-level design docs and proposals have mostly been authored by people within Google, and that's kind of weird because you know. Look at all the names of the companies that are using Go today. You know, Google is just one name among many, and Go is, you know, really an open source community project. And so, another you know document that is now up is this change uh, proposal process, by which you know, people in the community can propose a change that they want to make to the to the language, um, get it reviewed by the core contributors to the language, and um, so go through a general process instead of having to kind of. Uh, operate by the sort of unspoken rules by which that has uh, taken place up to this point. And another talk that was really inspiring, kind of in the theme of you know community and being welcoming to newcomers of the language, was uh, Audrey Lim's talk. So this was a woman who, like a year ago, literally was a lawyer who had zero programming experience, and within a year, you know, she learned Go as her first serious you know backend programming language. And a year later, she has a development job at Nitrous IO, and so it kind of counteracts uh, the the uh, notion in in some circles that Go is kind of like a serious, you know, complex systems language that is inaccessible to beginners. Here's a person who learned Go as basically her first language, and was able to spin up not only on the language but also a bunch of core CS concepts in the process. So that was really cool. So another big topic uh, was history in general, like historical context, both in terms of how Go has evolved over time, and you know what are the roots of Go? Where did it come from? So you know the the, the five um, probably perhaps the most five uh, most influential languages in the Go lineage were Algol 60, uh, Pascal, C, Modula, and Oberon, and. Um, these were covered in Robert Griesmer's talk on uh, the evolution of Go, and he, I'd highly encourage everyone to go take a look at that. It was super informative. Um, he basically went on like a whirlwind tour of programming language uh, history over the past uh, like 30 or 40 years, and it was really fascinating to see like a lot of the features and concepts that we you know really like in Go and make Go elegant. See where they came from. Um, so Go began with this question, you know, that was asked among uh, Russ Cox, uh, uh, sorry, not, not Russ Cox, uh, Ken Thompson, uh, Rob Pike, and Robert Griesmer, um, you know, what should a modern programming language look like? And I think, um, I forget who it was, but someone made the joke that they asked this question while waiting for some C++ code to compile, <laughs> something like that. Um, so they began with this question, and early on, you know, there was a lot of informal discussion between the three of them. It's a very uh, informal, consensus-driven process, and it's interesting to note that early on, you know, most of the features proposed by the three of them were rejected by the other two in the party. They came from very different worlds, and so they had kind of like a, a very diverse uh, set of opinions and thoughts around, you know, what a modern programming uh, language should look like. Um, over time. That kind of original vision uh, was solidified into an actual language, and you know, sort of philosophy began to uh, coalesce around uh, the language. And I think Russ Cox summed this up very well in his opening keynote um, in this phrase: "Do less, enable more." So Go is all about you know doing less, not implementing um, all the language features out there that will enable the language to reach you know 99% of the use cases. But you know, focusing on a smaller core set of primitives that maybe cover 80% of the use cases that people want, and then enabling people to build more complex solutions on top of that strong core. So this was a recurring theme in his talk: do less, enable more. And then you know, again, Robert Griesmer 
uh, touch upon this. Um, you know, a lot of critics of Go uh, say that the language doesn't really innovate in any real way. They're not, we're not uh, advancing the state of the art in you know, programming language design. And Robert had this great point in his talk about, you know, you know, taking from uh, CAR C Tony Core, um, you know, this thought that the task of a programming language designer is not so much you know innovation, but more consolidation. Like looking at the past, seeing what has worked well in practice, and incorporating those ideas um, in in an elegant way. And you know, moving looking forward, Andrew Duran, uh, sorry, Andrew Duran uh, talked a lot about um, how how the Go community and the processes have evolved from the early days of uh, you know consensus driven informal discussions uh, to now you know like a worldwide community that is starting to adopt you know a little bit more process to facilitate um, you know more uh, diversity and contributions from the community. Uh, it's still the early days for Go. You know, um, even though we've come a long way uh, from when it was just uh, like an internal project inside Google, um, we are still kind of uh, at the cusp of, of adoption in the broader um, uh, mainstream enterprise. And that kind of segues well into the, the third large theme that we noticed, which was um, this idea that you know, Go is now becoming a mainstream language in uh, the enterprise. And it's probably only going to become more so in the next couple of years. And uh, so Peter Bergen, in his talk, he talked about GoKit, which is his, uh, um, it's basically like a, a proposal for a set of libraries for writing you know, distributed web services inside uh, large companies. And a big motivation behind doing this is that up until now, a lot of people have said, you know, Go is a great language uh, for, at the systems level to replace, you know, core infrastructure. But a lot of people still say, you know, I prefer, you know, Ruby or Python or Java for the application layer logic that um, encodes the quote unquote business logic. Um, GoKit, one of its goals is to really uh, change that discussion and convince people that Go is, is really a general purpose language that's easy to use and is great for, for um, developing things at the application layer as well. And then there was a, just a whole slew of talks uh, that were of you know, the form, you know, we wrote or rewrote our system in Go and it's worked amazingly well. So those are great case studies to look at if you know, uh, you're looking to grow uh, the usage of Go inside your company. So beyond uh, you know, just the, the talks that fit into those three general themes, there are you know, a whole other there, there are a lot of talks that were just you know, very interesting and, and useful. So you know, a lot of useful tools, new features, best practices were, were discussed. So Dmitry Vaikov talked about um, some great dynamic uh, tools uh, that he's developed, like, the, like Go Fuzz, which can help you uh, test your um, you know, Go programs robustly. Uh, Derek Parker talked about this really awesome uh, new debugger he's created um, that helps you debug uh, Go programs. Ben Johnson had a really cool talk about using the, uh, the Go SSA package in the standard library to do static analysis. I think one of the biggest uh, advantages of Go um, is the fact that uh, kind of the internals of the compiler and the SD are so readily accessible to, to users of the language via the standard library. Uh, Hannah Kim talked about um, Go for mobile devices. So you, now you can write Go and have it cross compile down to iOS and uh, Android, which is awesome. Um, Rick Hudson had a really interesting talk about designing the uh, garbage, or redesigning the Go garbage collector in version 1.5 to make it, I think, more than two orders of magnitude faster uh, in terms of, or I shouldn't say faster, two orders of magnitude smaller in GC pauses with very little trade-off in you know, overall performance. Uh, of course, there was Brad Fitzpatrick's talk about generics in Go 1.6. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that was an actual talk. Um, uh, Catherine Cox Bidet talked about uh, simplicity in Go, and um, it was a great talk kind of questioning this notion of uh, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity is like a common refrain you hear in the Go language community, but uh, too often it's kind of used as like a crux for like, I'm just going to say simplicity and like end of the discussion. Um, so she's talking about like, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, we should actually think about, um, you know, whether simplicity helps achieve our goals um, or not. Uh, Tomas and Art um, talked about, you know, uh, using interfaces to design um, various uh, patterns in Go. Uh, he talked about how how he came upon this like really cool uh, pattern 
that was basically the equivalent of the decorator pattern in other languages uh, using interfaces. And uh, Sam Hellman, Kyle Irv talked about how to use struct tags as a language feature that's uh, incredibly useful, but beginners might not uh, know exactly how to use, use it. There's no real like uh, official documentation about you know, what is the structure of a, a, a struct tag and what that should be like. Sarah Adams talked about you know, generating code for the sake of consistency in your code base. And Kevin Cantwell talked about you know, a bunch of gotchas that might uh, bite you um, if you're new to Go. And uh, in addition to just the main talks, there were a whole bunch of lightning talks. It was like an entire day of lightning talks. Um, many thanks to Bill Kennedy for covering those. You should go check them out. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of good talks uh, in there. One of the talks was from the, the person who kind of led the effort to re-implement uh, healthcare.gov uh, from like a messy enterprise Java app in, to like a smooth, sleek, uh, uh, 21st century Go application. Um, and so definitely check those out. And I guess in closing, I just want to say like looking forward, it's been another great year for the Go community. Uh, interest in Go continues to grow. And I think we as a community have done a great job of um, kind of building, using the language to its fullest extent, building amazing things on top of it and really proving uh, the value to uh, other people who are looking for you know, better languages and uh, technology to adopt internally. That having been said, we have a long way to go, a long way ahead of us you know, in terms of building the community, making sure that it's inclusive and we welcome, continue to welcome beginners, um, making sure we understand the historical context uh, and kind of using that to inform uh, the way we think about um, you know, designing features of the language that are not technically features of the language, but are kind of like part of the broader uh, milieu um, that remain open. You know, things like, you know, uh, special comments like go generate, uh, build tags, things like that that remain uh, to be implemented in the language. That's something that um, we need to decide. Oh, and dependency management is another big thing. Um, that's something that we need to decide and settle on as a community, and so we should be cognizant of of you know the, the the lessons learned in the past there, and then finally you know driving more adoption of Go in the enterprise and continuing to demonstrate that you know Go is a very general purpose language um, and it's a great tool for building uh, things that target a lot of different platforms. So you know it's been an awesome ride so far, but we still have a long way to go. This is a graph showing you know Go lang search queries compared to queries for uh, another. A uh, large kind of enterprisey language that I will not name, but as you can see, the other language is slowly declining, and Go is uh, increasing at a rapid rate. But there's still a, a <laughs> wide gap to be to be bridged. So special thanks to uh, Bill Kennedy, uh, Alan Shreve, and Dennis Coldwell. They helped us uh, live blog the talks. They took a, a lot a lot off our plate, so we're very thankful to them. And that's it for me. Go and check out uh, the, the talks. The slides are up in, in our repository. The videos will be up in two weeks. And all in all, I'm just happy to be part of such an amazing language community. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? I'm curious how many people here attended GopherCon. How many people here attended GopherCon? Yeah. Okay. So like about half, maybe 40%. Cool. Any other questions? All right, thanks. Cool.